Awesome. So this is all about you and your journey in music, uh, how you got to where you are now. Well, I know you have an extensive solo career and obviously, and then this whole making of this record and Moon vs. Sun and, and the, the, there's like a documentary behind it. I'd love to hear all about it. Yeah. So, um, wow. I wouldn't really know to be, <laughs> that's a loaded question. I, uh, well, where were you born and raised? Let's start there. Yeah, I was going to say I was born and raised in um, a place called Winnipeg, Canada, which um, is the coldest place that is populous on the planet besides Siberia. Interesting. And, and so you're inside a lot, I think, probably in the winter. I mean, we do really embrace the, the winter vibes, uh, especially as children. Mm -hmm. You know, you're, we're hardy. We're a hardy stock. Um, but there's there's a lot of, of music. Um, I don't know if there's more music. You know, because I wasn't raised somewhere else too. I didn't have a parallel dimension, but sure. the thing about me that is, you know, and, it, and it's, it's something now I'm, you know, I'm, I'm older now, so I feel like I can be a little bit objective. You know, people come to me often and they say, oh, how do you, how do you do that? Like, how are you in the business? And how I, I've always been in the music business. I've always been somehow, um, working as a musician as a singer as a songwriter in theater doing something some tv something right mm -hmm. and um and i say to people that i don't think that there is any code i don't think there's any you know model that works um and i and i think that you know people can have you have to have some luck but i think that some people have extraordinary luck and and at some point it's all luck because what you're born with is your luck in your life, you know, but my luck, I think, began with the fact that, you know, as a child, from a very, very young age, probably approximately two or three, I, I could play anything back. Oh, wow. Yeah, I had perfect pitch. I've always had perfect pitch. And I could play anything back. So, so that by the time I was seven years old, six years old, eight years old, if we went to the movies and came home, everybody knew I, you know, I would go into the piano room and I, I'd be playing the score of the film that we were just at. Like that's oh, who I was. Wow. I was on a children's music oriented show from when I was little. Um, that was sort of a big thing. And it was, it, there was a major network in Canada back then called CTV. Uh -huh. And this, this aired on Western Canada CTV. So everything from Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, British Columbia, I was on a show. Okay. It wasn't in Eastern Canada. Interesting. But, yeah. So I was up at a microphone in a studio singing songs, um, you know, that that they were written by someone else. But I was writing songs from when I was very little. When I was a little girl and my mom would put me to sleep at night, I remember she would sit on my bed and she would read to me. And then she didn't sing to me. I sang to her the songs I was writing. So wow. it was, it was a, yeah. And also my dad came from a second generation farm that, um, you know, my, my Ukrainian basically refugee parent, grandparents, you know, had, had established my great grandparents. And there was an old, old piano in there, an old piano. And um, my dad, when my, my, when my Gigi, my grandfather inherited this farm, he and my Baba had 13 kids. Oh my gosh. They kept 12. One they gave away in uh, the hospital because the lady had lost her baby. So my, my, my Baba had had twins. So she gave one away. That's how oh, wow. many children they had too many mouths to feed. Huh? Yeah. But they I've had never heard that story children. before. Wow. They were very religious. Oh yeah. My dad found him, but he still doesn't go up to him. He just drives by his house and oh. he feels uncomfortable to disrupt his life, but he did find him. But anyway, so my 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 family my dad's family they were very religious people and they had a, a piano it's an old piano and it's still there and our family someone in the family always has the farmhouse you know and um it gets sort of passed around and everyone was always around that piano and i was always the last one at the piano and i would play the hymns there were hymns there and by the way i was always studying music too my parents noticed i was obviously freakishly born with my abilities and mm -hmm. so they had me in what was called the royal conservatory of music uh it's based on a british system of, of study of music which i believe is is absolutely fantastic for, for technical skills mm -hmm. 
So that coupled with my personal imagination for music and creativity, I think is the, is the equation of me. Now, the other thing is that my grandparents, my maternal grandparents were a duo. Really? So my great, so my grandfather, Walter, he played the fiddle and my grandmother, Isabel, um, played the mouth harp. It was called not okay. the, harmonica, the, the, the mouth harp. And my first memory of my life is I'm sitting on my, my grandpa, on my grandma's knee under the phone. You know, the phone used to be on the wall. Yeah, yeah. And I'm on the, I'm on, I'm leaning it on my, on my grand, on my grandmother. And no, I'm on my grandpa sitting on my grandpa's knee and he's somehow playing a fiddle and bopping me on his knee, I guess. And my grandmother is across from him on a chair in front of the fridge. You know, those chairs that they're, they're like that horrible pr plastic. They crack, you know, the old chairs. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. I'll go now, whatever. But anyway, <laughs> and they're playing together. They're in a duo. My, my grandparents used to play during the prohibition. They'd go to the hall and they'd be the entertainment. People would leave money in the jar. People would bring their own alcohol at the hall. So, wow. so my first memory is literally I am sitting literally sa sandwiched in a duo and now i'm you know 45 years later i'm i'm a duo i'm part of a mm -hmm. duo and it's with my husband and my husband's grandfather was also named walter so we have all these cute you know that's amazing things. but anyway so that's my story and then i was always kind of for a long time um i was the weird kid that like if there was you know my choir teacher at school goes Chantal can you sing a C please Mrs. Honey isn't here today to play the piano so oh, have be, nah, you'd have to be the <laughs> you'd have to be the keyboard the the fill in <laughs> and then and then I was the one you weren't supposed to have the lead in the in the elementary school play until you were in sixth grade because that's your graduating oh. year from sixth grade you know it's from elementary but I had the lead in fifth and sixth grade oh and so, you know and then the kids were mean to me and I got bullied. And then the whole school got a talking to about bullying because of me. Wow. You know? Oh, so it was almost and like a blessing and a curse kind of for you. Terrible. I and and the thing is it's hard because I'm watching our kids, but you know what? Things can be hard, things can be easy. There's no prediction of why something's gonna work out. But mm -hmm. I watch with our kids and it's like I have one son that he's incredibly talented as a musician as well. Like that's his, you know, clearly he's that. But then the genes. <laughs> he plays sports and I, I have to tell you, I appreciate sports as a parent in the family dynamic uh -huh. because with, with arts, there's no schedule. Mm -hmm. The schedule of arts is, um, is go, go out in the world and mess up and be in pain and, and you're, you're left your own de devices and that's where your art, your, your pain, your art comes from your pain. Mm -hmm. Um, but when you're a parent, you, you want to protect your child. And so you don't want an artist in a way, you know, like, I don't know, is it possible to be like, oh, yeah, my 12, 15, 14 year old's a brilliant artist and she's not fucked up at all. Like, I don't know. <laughs> right. I don't know that. I don't know that. <laughs> I feel like, I feel like, you know, I'd be better to say, you know, he's, he's playing a high level of basketball. He's all also right. talented. Let's see where that goes and just get some, you know, some regimen and and some structure and and take it from there I, I i don't know it's um it's a frightening world especially for kids now so i don't mm -hmm. know if i would recommend it but it was hard for me then whereas my husband if i might speak for him he loved music but he was older when he first decided to master you know the guitar and and start songwriting he fell in love with bands mm -hmm. See, I, in my head i already was a band Okay. Like, born, you know, and and like I was writing songs when I was very little. They, there was no, not much of a teacher for me or something I sought after. No one was famous where I was from. Mm -hmm. The most famous person was Monty Hall, and he was a uh, the the game show host for Let's Make a Deal. Yeah, I know who he is. No one, okay. <laughs> no one was famous. No one was famous, and so there was no fame coming. You know, it mm -hmm. wasn't like that. Whereas my husband was from Toronto and there were plenty of, you know, I mean, yeah. my God, some of the most famous comedians in the world and sure. musicians. We, a lot we of talent love, out of Toronto. Right. I mean, we used to love to say in Winnipeg that Neil Young went to a year of high school. 
at um, Kelvin High School. And like that made the high school so cool, you know, but I mean, did anyone really ever see, see Neil Young? I don't know. Um, of course, we also had BTO, Back in General Overdrive and Burton Cummings. That was something that was kind of a thing too. But, but yeah, there really wasn't a lot of like, hey, go after this, you'll be famous. Or, hey, listen to this and you'll want to be like that. <clears throat> I was raised in the church, sang hymns. And, and and sort of, um, it was called like, not soul music, it was called, uh, what's the word they would use for spiritual music? I can't even remember, like Michael W. Smith and Amy Grant, you know, those were the the big camp rebel. <laughs> I don't oh, know. sure, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> and my mom had one that she loved to listen to named, named Evie, and I loved her. <clears throat> and then um, also in my house, my mom and dad like you know John Lennon and Yoko's Double Fantasy and mm-hmm. um and 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 then there was pop music and I had cousins who listened to crazy best 60s 70s music but then we also had to go to the church one night and learn about Led Zeppelin how when you play it backwards stairway to heaven backwards that it's the devil like the devil talking did you know that? oh yeah I've heard that about a few songs isn't there a Beatles song that they said that too or like but see and that's that's funny you say that because like it's so stupid like you know mom and dad are listening to double fantasy by john and yoko over right. here but john's band no 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 right right <laughs> but yeah and so then my you know you were like my brothers were rebels if they listened to black sabbath or um you know judas priest so i had a lot coming coming at me you know fleetwood mac with my girl cousins and mm-hmm. um lots of good stuff but i you know, but I, for example, I never got into Carol King or, or even Joni till much later. It was a oh. pretty mostly male dominated experience mm-hmm. um, of music, but, but really rich. I, I think really rich. And, and a lot of that, to, to, to circle back to the original thing about how, you know, um, the luck of it, um, you know, to circle back to that, the truth is that honestly, a lot of what I am today and how it happened is because it was inside of me, mm-hmm. you know, to this day, I do not like to listen to tons of music because I have something inside of me that I want to come out. It's, you know, and I always feel like if I listen to too much music, then I'm going to just make that because I'm a mimic with my ear. You know what I mean? So that's the danger for me. I have both yeah. going on. Yeah, because you so, have that perfect pitch and you can remember the notes. Yes, so it's almost like, yes. am I copying something I had That's already it. heard or? It's, it's, it's exactly. So I, I like to, you know, I have a, I have just an absolute penchant for like whatever my OG is inside of me. And I mean, my husband will get so annoyed with me because we'll be driving and I'll just be like, oh, kill me. Could I, can I take a separate vehicle? Because I can't listen <laughs> to a singer songwriter. I just can't do it. I can't do it. And, and it's caused some serious rows in our, um, you know, in our otherwise perfect relationship. <laughs> sure. <laughs> well, I love that you guys are doing this as a husband and wife duo. Cause yeah. This podcast started with my wife and I, uh, oh, I we started that. it, but um, it, we do the interviews together. But now since COVID happened, we have two kids also. So right. it's like somebody's got to yeah. play, you know, yeah. referee well, in the other room. That's a lot- that's a lot better when, than when I thought you were going to say, which oh. is, you know, now, you know, now since COVID, we can't stand each other. And it's kind of, you know, not <laughs> yeah. <laughs> since COVID, I've, I got up, to, I picked up and left, got a different apartment. <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah. It's you, just the, got a the sparse look behind you. Very bachelor cave. So I wouldn't be surprised. If oh, well, it's because we just moved to Nashville like, um, okay. like a month ago. Okay. So people are like, what's going on in there? I'm like, it's just minimal. Just not a lot yet. We just haven't had a chance though. Yeah, we're in the process of unloading everything we still own and moved you. from Southern California here. So <laughs> hey, I believe you, man. I believe you. <laughs> right, right. That's what I've been telling people at least. <laughs> Look good. Look good. <laughs> Everything's gonna be okay, man. <laughs> I hope that's what everyone keeps telling me. <laughs> just kidding. Uh well, so I'm curious on the perfect pitch. Um, yeah. you know, having that. I mean, it's obviously amazing and and what a gift, but also like being a kid or even in, like you said, you got the, you know, the lead in fifth and sixth grade, like having to listen to people sing 
off key or people trying to cover songs that you know are like not even close was that ever something that were like like irritating like, well, i don't know I think there's a difference between having perfect pitch and being able to perform perfect pitch okay you know like and let me try to explain that to you so it's like if i hear if somebody sings and they're like or i hear a song and you know it's um you know, we were talking about double fantasy and, and let's say I heard, you know, woman, mm -hmm. I can hardly express. Um, I've never played this before. I can hardly piano that i can remember <laughs> but you can just do it right there yeah, I just do it so my, oh my God. has a lot more in my opinion to do with like i can mess with anything and just that's see? so fantastic so you just if you just said oh yeah there's that new song blah 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 i just play it for you you know what i'm saying yeah yeah because so, you can hear it already and you can just figure out on the on the piano it's, where exactly it's, it's it sits. A form of, it's a form of genius. Like you just sit and you play it. Like I don't need someone to show me the fucking chords or read anything. Like it's, That's so, so amazing. Right. And then the other thing is that, you know, if someone says, you know, like, okay, so we're doing this song. <laughs> I'd like to do more like in like no 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 I'll just be like okay like I just know you do do you know what I'm saying no I I do I'm not I'm not explaining it well but what I'm trying to say is that <clears throat> I'm a jukebox I'm a transposer I can play anything back I know what note like for example sometimes I just can't listen to music because I know every note as it's playing so it's like I just want to tell everybody like, <laughs> no one can understand that unless like it's very hard for me to sort of shut off like I have to focus on something else because otherwise I start to just know every single thing that's going on right. and that's really creepy and weird and, and exhausting so it's different than now let me go sing you know all the best um what's any song you know to listen to that back uh -huh. is my pitch spot on eh, maybe <laughs> probably like, oh, but it's not it's not like i sang it and it was perfect like i listen got to it thing and to me she's got one of the best voices or uh -huh. pink or whatever it's like you can still be a little off when you're when you're performing sure you know so it depends on what you're you're saying what is perfect pitch i'm talking about perfect pitch in the sense of like I know what every note is. I may not sing it, it. I know what is going on globally, universally. Yeah. Okay. Universally. That makes you know more sense. Uh, I, yeah. Instead of just hearing, okay, she's off. To, she's off. Which you could probably tell anyway. Like, okay, she's off key. Yeah. But you can but hear. I, know what I am. But right. But you can hear what instrument. something. Yeah. You know exactly what notes are being played yeah. as now, it's happening. Now, some sometimes people are singing off pitch because they literally don't have any pitch. Yeah. Right, right like they, right. they can't hear pitch properly i can and i can irritate myself when for whatever reason my throat is just not giving me my instrument that day mm -hmm. i just woke up i've oversang. it's not as easy other days it's just it's it's a control thing with my voice if i have complete control of my voice then my pitch could be really great the whole time mm -hmm. but there's going to be people who you know like 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 i said my husband started later so I remember at the beginning of our relationship, we were very young when we met. I'd be like, no, 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 babe. And I'd, I'd keep showing him and pushing him. And he's slowly developed, I would say, incredible pitch in his own ear via like practicing, by, via the practice of being a, a musician. You know, even mm -hmm. his singing, he has become a much, much more pitch oriented singer. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you start, like can, you not, can start hearing it more. You can start and, hearing that. Yeah. But for me, I'm starting, everything for me is engineered backwards. Like I started on 10 
and I'm using it and I'm always trying to like pull back. Like I'm always trying to stay there. Whereas other people, I think they're, they're moving forward and they're, you know what I mean? It's, it's very hard to explain, but that's fascinating. Um, my relationship with music is odd because I literally didn't have a choice. Like it overcame me. You know, mm -hmm. when I, can you imagine I'm three, four years old and I'm watching Sesame Street or the electric company and I'm just going back and forth to the piano and playing the songs that are being, you know, performed and like, you know what I'm saying? Like, no, totally. So early. So I've never, I've never known that story. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So of course it's what became my life, but, <clears throat> but I think, yeah, there's, there's curses involved with it. And, um, and you have to navigate those things, you know, whatever your whatever your luck. Sure. Sure. But with that, like, okay. So you obviously, this has been with you as long as you can remember, um, you know, <laughs> you're playing yeah. at two, three years old. Yeah. You get, Tell me about when you get signed to, you know, you get, you get a first deal with Columbia Records. Like, was yeah. that always like, a you already kind of knew like, okay, well, I know I'm going to pursue music. This is like what I'm here to do. Um, yeah, I mean, the record deal I is think, just the next thing in, you yeah, know, line. Yeah, I mean, I think, look, I came from a really small place where, like I said, nothing happened to people right. like that. And at the same time, I was really dedicated to my craft. And I was mm -hmm. really dedicated to the arts. Um, did I have a plan? No, I had a few people who believed in me as I got older and older um, in my teens that, you know, um, that I had something really special and they had like a, 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 they were sitting on a bigger perch. You know what I mean? Like they could see Toronto, they could see mm -hmm. the US, they could see bigger. And they were like, no, no, it doesn't matter where you're from. This is a talent. <laughs> this person is talented. And I sort of was lucky to have those people. One of them was a guy called Chris Burke Gaffney. He was in a great, um, there's sort of a group of, of bands um, from Winnipeg. Um, one of them is called, um, uh, shit, why do I always forget the name of it? They've got such a beautiful song. April Wine, April Wine. They have this song. Tonight is a wonderful time to fall in love. Oh yeah. And I mean, I always thought that song was, like a huge world hit. It's not. Mm -hmm. It was like Manitoba, Saskatchewan, maybe. I don't know. And then there was this band called um, The Pumps and, and they had an offshoot band called Orphan. And there was a song that Orphan had and it was called Miracle. <clears throat> and um, it was one of my favorite songs and it was on, on all my mixtapes. And it would be right next to like U2 and The Fix, you know, mm -hmm. like uh, um, or, or um, Talking Heads or whatever. And, um, you know, these huge, huge hit songs. And I thought that or Orphan song Miracle is called Miracle, that it was the same level hit. Like I didn't know I was a kid. And then one day someone said to me, oh my gosh, that's Chris Gaffney. And in and, and like a cafe in, in, in Winnipeg, I was 19 and no, 20, maybe 20. And uh, I, I literally thought I was going to pee my pants because in my head, Orphan was the most beautiful song ever written. Mm -hmm. And I walked up to him and I said, hi, I'm Chantal and I'm a songwriter and I'm a huge fan. And he was like this really, like, really lovely, decent man, a good guy who had his sights set on a future of developing artists and writing. You know, he's very much a collaborator. And um, I guess he thought I was like, you know, pretty serious and took me seriously. And, and he said, well, let's have a meeting. And, and it was incredible. I, that was my break. That was my, oh, my moment. Wow. Yeah. And so I, I went uh, and, and had, you know, sat at the piano with him and we wrote more songs over time. And, and then we had another person involved that um, had a studio and we recorded, uh, we basically ended up with a demo tape that, that, mm -hmm. you know, we, we sent off to a couple of labels and, that was it. I had a publishing deal and a record deal. Wow. And it was from, a, in particular, a song I wrote called Surrounded. And mm -hmm. I have to say that the song, I think now, no offense to Chris, but I can't even listen to the demo. It's the worst thing I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> the demo or, or the one that made the record? No, the demo. Okay. The demo. My first album, eh, it's good. I It wasn't what I, it's, it's a tough thing, the first album. You know, that wasn't mm. my second album. That in my head is, I wish was my first in a way, not the songs all necessarily, because I love all the songs I've written, like in my own solo career. I, I, I really love, I'm proud of them. 
but you know how the sound the sound comes out right in, in the production mm -hmm. that's a tough thing for you really a really young person being sort of swept up and everybody's got their vision and um I, I, you know, it's funny. I, I was asked um, to go with Eric Ross, who did Corey Amos's Under the Pink, and I almost went with Eric, and then I ended up going with Peter Asher and Matt Wallace, and there were all sorts of amazing things that came of that for my first album. But I couldn't, I didn't have, I, I blame myself. I didn't have a lot of the language that one needs, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and point of references, points of reference, mm -hmm. in order to show what I wanted. Sure. And so I just did a lot of crying by myself uh, oh because yeah you couldn't express to them exactly what you were going for so no and no and also it's like i suddenly i signed a record deal in february can you imagine this recorded at the top studios all over los angeles including conway um you know a m um you know my 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 friends became, you know, Adam Sandler and Keanu Reeves. And, you know, I literally, <laughs> oh. were, were, I was like literally next door to both of those acts while I was recording my album. Like, I mean, this was my new life. And by sure. September, I had an album out and I was traveling around the world oh with Sony. Gosh. So it was too much for me to, um, you know, I, I, I didn't have the same experience say, as Alanis where she went around to like hundreds of studios and people. Mm -hmm. and worked with lots of people and then finally hit it when she and Glenn met like that mm -hmm. was her person mm -hmm. so a lot of it has to do with yeah me just not really having the language and and also like there were no women there was no women back then maybe a woman who answered the phone at a and do you know what I mean right like, it was a lot of men and it's like Chantal here's your band this is your studio band and it was like Oh, Some guys. guy showed up in like crazy leather pants that was like getting paid, you know, $1,500 a day and thought his shit didn't stink. He was a fucking asshole to me. I was always having anxiety about being in a room with him, but I didn't feel good about saying anything. He's probably a lovely guy. I just, I couldn't process things well and uh -huh. felt his, his aloofness was, you know, he hated it. It was bizarre. Like what um, an intimidating situation. Uh, very intimidating. Yeah. Oh, you know, gosh. and then there would be someone else that I did get along with and, then I would feel bad that I might, you know, I was thinking about all sorts of things, except now I get in the studio. It's like, dude, I've got three kids. I have two hours. Let's write a hit song. I, <laughs> let's, let's get the hell out of here. <laughs> like, I'm just going to assume we love each other. We don't need to pick on one another. Like, let's just get our shit done. It's a very different thing now, right? Sure, sure. Right. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, it was just a lot. Um, I feel like I had a little bit more magic in terms of dynamics. Uh, on the second album when I recorded with Jay Joyce do you know Jay Joyce he's in Nashville he's you gotta look mm -hmm. him up you gotta interview him you gotta I will he's, he's he's Emmy Lou Harris's guy for the most part for okay for, I think at least production is not writing um and write um, his name he, down right now he is just one of the most talented forces of nature imaginable um and he's you know it's funny because the second album it also uh, my A&R person must have thought, you know, Mike Roth was his name. That's who signed me. Um, he must have really thought it was important that the piano was complemented by the guitar. Because my, my, both of those albums were very guitar heavy. Mm -hmm. But on the second album, it was done differently. It was done differently. Um, it had a little, it was a little more progressive sounding, which I think was what I was looking for in mm -hmm. my head. And I couldn't explain it. So um yeah so just working with it with it with a different person was were you do you feel like also that you weren't as green to the situation well, now I because you had say, you, had, you put a record out confidence yeah um, i had my footing a little more in my now i'd met my husband by the time I, I was recording my second album i think i was living with my husband and and i had a sounding board i had a personal sounding board for the first time in my life uh-huh imagine like I'd never to that day had someone I went home to and sat and I who would like, give me a lyric or like, right. try that, you know, go, go somewhere like a different perspective. Never. I never had that until that moment. That's interesting. And, and cause his band had already taken off at that point, right? When you guys had met. Well, no. So what's interesting is that when I met Rain, I didn't know Our Lady Peace. Oh, you In didn't. In fact, I remember I was sitting, we, we met at, at a Pearl Jam concert and, and, um, the, I saw him behind me when I sat down. He was so cute. And I said to the label president who happened to be sitting next to me, I said, 
you know, who's that? And he goes, oh, that's Rain from Our Lady Peace. And I just thought he had just said such a strange mouthful of like, I don't know, Eastern or Indian or Iranian words. Like I didn't know what he said. And um, I just said, oh yeah, introduce us, you know. And when he introduced us, um, that was it for Rain and I. We 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 really we had a very strong friendship for mm -hmm. several months, but we really liked each other a lot. And and um, I was sort of in his life suddenly while he was recording Clumsy. Wow. So he was bringing home the the demos the recordings for Clumsy. Of the day, you know, um, I would get to listen to them like in his car late at night or something like that after the studio. At that point, um, Naveed had been out. Okay. So, you know. Wow, but yeah, still, I yeah. mean, to hear so he's bringing home like yeah, like super. Oh my god! Dead and those those, oh those early Listen, recordings. When he put out, <laughs> I remember, I remember being outside his mom's in the car and listening to Carnival. Okay. I think that's what it's called, and I was like, Yeah, that's. A, I mean, Carnival's the song on their that record. It must be that one. Yeah, it's like it's like. Yeah. I gotta cover that song. It's you should. So, you should give it to him for his birthday or something. That'd be awesome. I love that song. But I remember sonically sitting in his car, get a Nissan Pathfinder. And it was dark. And oh my God, it just um, brings back so many memories to think of how that felt. To hear that song yeah so i was listening to all those songs before they came out and then of course the album just you know and i've never known anything different you know that's uh -huh. the boyfriend he has a crazy you know huge hit record, <laughs> and I had record too. so we were kind of we met and we met when each other was i met him on the first day i'd ever been to toronto i think uh, i didn't have a friend yet i invited the makeup artist from the video shoot that day to come with me to the program concert because i was given six tickets and i didn't know anybody so i gave the other four away they were somewhere else in the arena uh-huh and i sat next to rain i sat in front of rain with this girl <clears throat> wow yeah what a, and um that's crazy yeah that's so that's, amazing yeah, that, yeah he was basically one of the first very first people i met uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> what a dummy <laughs> <laughs> wow okay yeah. and then yeah. i mean obviously you've been married for what 20 years so two years I mean, guess this year is 22 years or 22, 22 years? years oh my and, gosh and together 26 wow and when do you guys start writing music and putting music together pretty early on or i mean you didn't didn't well, really release anything you know, as a project till recently. yeah it's, it's interesting there is a birthplace for sure of us playing together i i think the real real birthplace is when he started being my sounding board okay. you know i i remember i was writing a song called time i don't remember if he's credited as a writer on it i think he is because he helped me with that or he helped and that was on my third album on my second album which I told you now, I already had my first album, The Can. I was I was shooting my video for my my first single the day I met him. But for oh, the wow. second album, my cousin passed, and um, that was the one who I was always, you know, singing and dancing to Fleetwood Mac with. Um, <clears throat> and she was more like my sister, so it was a really devastating um, thing, and still is. And and so I wrote a song called Far Away uh, about about Brenda. And I, I can remember that, you know, I would be stuck somewhere and I would show it to him. I can remember being very nervous showing him, you know, and asking him. And he was busy with his own shit, but he was mm -hmm. like, oh, that's great. You should say this there or something like he would he would give me, you know, a nudge with one word or, you know, or he'd say, that's great. Stop. Like, why are you writing another part? You see, there's four parts there or something like he just. And so he just started becoming somebody I could co collaborate with. Mm -hmm. And then, you know without sounding like like a jerk i'm sure there was stuff also as we were living together that you know with our lady peace and he always recorded everything at home he was doing a lot of it you know there was stuff with the band but he was the driving force of the, of the writing mm -hmm. and i i would say stuff i would i would suggest things in front of him in front of the band and they may or may not take something i don't know but there was just a, a respect mm -hmm. you know even though we were very much our own forces in our own careers and our own musical minds and then um, 
the big probably, I mean, the two big game changers were that he uh, started making a couple solo albums when the children were really little. He made one called Hunter's Lullaby, which is just absolutely phenomenal. Mm-hmm. Um, and he did another one called We All Get Lighter, and that was an EP. But I was his Linda Ronstadt on those. So I wasn't really writing on them. Mm-hmm. I was just putting in like the Elvis background. Gotcha. The background vocals. And, um, and I, I, it was a real neat, neat reprieve that the kids were in and out of the studio with that all the time because we were doing that or he started producing my albums, you know, like. Yeah, because you were still putting out records after you guys oh, had yeah. that and everything. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Were, you're yeah. still kind of just. I have nine solo and he has 10 with our little piece. So yeah. Yeah. And then, okay. um, and then, and then when he went on, he wanted a tour. So we did some touring together and I was his background singer, piano player. And then oh, he'd wow. come on tour with me and open for me as a solo artist because I was selling out my, you know, mm-hmm. bigger venues. And so then he had that. Um, and then I would go out with him in the States and he could, you know, draw crowds, obviously, from his history all over the States. And, wow. and so that was the beginning of, I think, playing together and also finding a sound together. Because when I look back on those albums he made, Moon vs. Sun isn't that much of a stretch. Some mm-hmm. rain solo stuff and my collaboration with him on that. Mm-hmm. There, there's there are similar, there's something now. Is there something obviously very different? There's something else when when Moon versus Sun now sits down. It's like we know what we are. Right. I'm not appearing or guesting on Rain Made Up. That's different too. Um, Rain Rain pro- his production on his own stuff is very progressive compared mm-hmm. to like the more organic feel that that Moon versus Sun is. Mm-hmm. Um, then the next thing that happened was as we became an old married couple people would invite us to play together at like charitable events and stuff like that uh, fundraisers and so on and um, and um, you know we'd get up together and I can remember I would say to him we need a song together because he'd be <laughs> playing the guitar when I would sing before you and I would be playing the piano and he would be doing, doing Superman's dad or something and it was like okay. hey, we need an us song to bridge sure it. sure and um <laughs> and then there was a song that we were listening to a lot by sage francis called called sun versus moon and it was kind of a bit of a theme song around our home just an absolute stunner and uh sage, sage is a spoken word poet but has such a musicality oh um, yeah yeah he, just, he's amazing He's amazing. He's yeah, amazing. I've seen him live a few times, and it, it, it yeah, he comes out with spiritual that, experience. With, yeah, he comes out with like a jacket with all the different corporation companies like all over it and everything. Anarchist, yeah, yeah. And so that song, um, it was so beautiful, and and sun versus moon, and then Rain was saying like maybe we're moon versus sun, you know, and then. Then we were born, and then one night we re- we recorded one song, the one called "I Love It When You Make Me Beg," uh-huh. and um, we really felt, you know, the way that we ended up sort of getting to where we made a, a documentary um, about our fucked upness and collaborating was that um, when we wrote the song "I Love It When You Make Me Beg," it was so big and bold and beautiful, and it knew what it was, and it was like, oh my god, we gotta we gotta do six, eight, ten of these pronto. Mm-hmm. But then it was busy. And every time I'd say, are we going to go in? It'd be like, oh my God, we end up falling asleep or, you know, have to fill out forms for the kids, blah, 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 or whatever. Like it's just, or someone was traveling or, and so it just it wasn't happening. And it became like, we had a friend who, Amy, who is a, a producing partner on the film. She really felt that we should, we should, she'd seen us play live together. Mm-hmm. And she like she'd been at a function or something, and she was like, "You two have such an amazing dynamic on stage." Because we sort of fight on stage and make jokes, and it's cute. Da 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 da. She goes, "You should really. We need to film that when you decide to finally make your album together." And <clears throat> we kind of took that and we thought, you know, we should. And maybe if we have the crew hired and everybody's ready to ready to go, then um, we can't cancel. And we'll be sequestered and oh, alone. I like that. And and in my head, I thought it would be really romantic. But <clears throat> leading up to the leaving, we we weren't doing so well as a couple. So we thought we should do t- some chopping up with our marriage coach. And then it became this thing of like, well, 
have the marriage coach in in the the thing hi Sal. have the marriage coach in the film mm-hmm. it's meaningful stuff and um i think most most marriages could could use a dr john <clears throat> sure and so um it became a little bit of a movement in our in our minds what if we could move the needle a little bit uh, for people as to what hope there was in their marriages and maybe it wasn't a stretch that collaborating as a couple could be similar to to collaborating as artists Mm -hmm. maybe it's not much different maybe there's a respect that's required maybe there's a balance of space and and voice and um there's equity right these relationships and they, they they function you know and rain and i we probably did need a lot of work even as artists collaborating together but when we're on stage and we sing together and we are performing together it's kind of magical we have a very magical dynamic that way so that was sort of our hope always you know what i'm saying that was almost Mm -hmm. like our like that's our starting point or our anchor or our yeah it's our hope Mm -hmm. it's our hopeful place um our strong point sure. so and, and it's we have, we have that advantage you know as a couple we have something that that can sort of almost like bitch slap us and, and tell us you know there's always something better mm-hmm. that you can do mm-hmm. so if that was the standard we had some work to do in our private space as a couple and and even as collaborators we had some some work to do um the truth is that, you know, documentaries don't say everything going on. Of course, on. yeah. They don't. And so they're, they're, the truth is there's, there's more than I want to share that's, that's there. We're in a bad place in that island for a couple of reasons. One is how cold it is and how far we were from the children. I, I personally never accounted for how depressed that I would be to be away from our children. Oh, like I didn't even think about So they didn't come with you. I, I haven't yeah. seen the film. I've just seen the trailer. Wow. Okay. So it was just the two of you and the, and the crew. And I was hateful. I was a raging mother bear. I could not handle it. Mm-hmm. And then, um, and then another truth that, that it doesn't show is, you know, Dr. John has been our coach for a dozen years and we have had great come to Jesus stuff in our life as a result of of working with John but the thing about marriage is that the work is never done (laughs) right that's why we wrote a song called the work that is now on this album uh it's not in the film the work it came after but we really love it It to to us it really summarizes the whole thing um and it's funny how that song came sort of retrospectively I think it's in a few interviews we've done already that's the gem of the album and I'm like oops that came it's not in the film it's after that's crazy but it is a special one and Uh you know when you start digging into the dynamics of family and marriage and and repeating of cycles and all that stuff you do learn this is not something you fix and then it's done this is work on yourself this is co-regulation this is stuff that you'll do your whole life Mm -hmm. it will be your toolkit you know um so when we when we left for Saint Pierre and when we were there, I would describe that as an off the rails point where we needed work and we weren't doing the work. Um, when you got there or when you left, when it when it we weren't it, in a great place when we left and then it worsened and we okay. knew we weren't in a great place, so we tried to do top up work with our our coach and had him join us so we would be prepared to go to Saint Pierre, but. Okay for whatever reason when the cameras turned on in saint pierre we were in a some stuff had gone on and it just went from bad to worse and i mean you know ultimately i think it made for a good music document documentary um jason hershorch uh, hershorn today in his um uh daily whatever he does his blog Uh uh-huh he described it as mini um the are you there sorry yeah as the mini some kind of monster okay mini monster something like that um and that's what it is and i i don't know and i don't know that we would have gotten the songs that we got like we worked through our issues in the music so that's why this album is what it is and i think it's a beautiful album and sometimes beautiful stuff comes from horrible crap i don't know 
Sure. You, yeah. Like, well, it's what's interesting is that you guys kind of set aside this time to go, you know, seclude yourself and like literally, you know, what a year after the whole world forces everyone to do just Same that. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm telling you, man, there are tools in that film. I mean, I listen, I'm not going to judge your whole empty apartment and your thing with your wife not being here. <laughs> But I think you and your wife can sit I, down with a glass of wine and watch that film. Okay. We will. We will. I just I I know. I I I'm curious. I don't know. Maybe it was was this supposed to come out before the pandemic? Because I've seen some interviews so with you guys prior. Actually, it was geofenced in Canada. Oh, it was. Okay. Where we're from. And and very well, you know, received. It was on our it was on HBO. It it, you know, and um the album's been out and and it's been very impactful, very okay. impactful. Because the album impactful. just came out here on the 23rd, like, like last ago, yeah. Yeah, like last yeah. week. Yeah. Okay. That's where I was and trying I mean, to put that, it all together. Has, I'm like, did I miss something? Because I'm no. watching these like YouTube interviews with you guys from like January of 2019. <laughs> like, yeah. Well, that has to do with the fact that it's not like you snap your fingers, you put it on iTunes and you promote. It's just, it's sure. it was too much work. And we wanted to do something special and make mm -hmm. sure that it had the right home and opportunities. And, and I think, I think, you know, I don't know. I think it's probably meant to have worked out as it did because we are in a pandemic mm -hmm. and people do need this kind of source art source, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. right now. So it's um, like you guys, did this before it all happened it's kind of like yeah. you can you can you can kind of it's in a weird sense like you can show people like how yeah. you dealt with it like at the time not even thinking that obviously a year or two later everyone would be in a similar situation correct, correct. wow yeah well when really you well. guys when you guys wrote the record in the in the film um is it was that was the project already going to be moon versus sun at this point or was it like okay oh, let's go do oh, yeah, this like, and i'm gonna know, break your heart it's gonna be a film and okay sorry well i'm gonna break your heart or i'm gonna break your heart sorry song. it was just a song song we're working on and okay. so we we bring that idea we had into the sessions in saint pierre and michelon and we we talk about it it becomes actually you need to see the film I know because, it just came out here. <laughs> okay, so, well, I, I can't talk you through this without it's hard. Like the I'm going to break your heart. There's a, I don't want to give it away. I don't want to be a spoiler. But <laughs> the 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 stuff that comes up while we're writing that song becomes a, a kind of a major plot. In ah, the film. Got you. OK, because we are having impasses throughout the film. That's a major one. OK. As artists, we do not agree about what the structure of that song is supposed to be. So funny. Someone on YouTube, we were on Seth Meyers and I, 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 I couldn't stay up. I was tired. So I went on YouTube and I watched it today and it was like thousands of people had already watched it and comments and people commenting. I'm like, oh shit. So I looked at the comments, never look at the comments. Um, and uh, somebody was like, this is a completely self-indulgent, shallow and petty situation. This film, um, can't believe they did it. Shame. <laughs> and like, like shame on them. It was just, right, of just, course. A, just an utterly like, just a, a, a review of vitriol. And they weren't even like talking about the Seth Meyers performance. No, they were just excited to have an opportunity to say how bad our film was. <laughs> wow. And like, Some people, it's like, you know, but, really? <laughs> I, no, but you know what? I thought about it. And well, first of all, I, I commented back. Oh, um, good. Yeah, my comment back was something like, this film arouses a response in each person that is very subject to their own personal experience in marriage and collaboration. <laughs> there you go. Therefore, you sound <laughs> quite self-realized and above <laughs> us. Congratulations. Wow. Well, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's the nice passive aggressive Canadian way. But, I love that. But, but as I thought of it later, the thing is that you could watch this film and be like, oh my God, these people are crazy. They are fighting over the bridge of a song, right? 
these people are crazy. Look at how massive their egos are. Like they can't, like, I can see that. I can totally see watching these two married artists that like you could just want to throw up. I mean, you have to see it, okay? I'm going but, to. But I also, I had this other thought about it. I was like, well, no, because this is my life. Mm -hmm. I don't go to a factory or a hospital or a school and teach. Like, I don't have that life. This is my life, writing songs and performing music, hustling songs, peddling songs. That's my life, you know? So to one person, yeah, that might just seem ridiculous. Oh, right. That's my life. Right. Exactly. That's your career. That's all. That's what you do. And that's what you're passionate well, about. And all I have. That's you know, yeah. everything. Exactly. So, that's all I've ever known since mm -hmm. I was born. So, <laughs> oh, well, you know, um, I can remember someone else came to the film, a, a, a friend, and he's sort of an influential promoter where I'm from. And we had like a, an event for my hometown to build the town. Mm -hmm. And um, he came back that stage after he goes, I have to go. I have to go home, blah, blah, blah. But he's like, I have no idea why you made that movie. Bye. I love you. And he left. <laughs> my husband was like, who is that guy? <laughs> you know, yeah. um, I'm from a very meat and potatoes kind of place. It's also got an artistic element to it. But mm -hmm. it's sort of strange. Like I watched my brother-in-law just sob and sob watching the film, how cathartic it was for him. Or my parents just love it. Or for some people, I think it's cringeworthy. For other people, it's, it's cathartic. Um, it, 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 it brings up your own experience and dynamics with marriage and, and, you know, familial relations. It's, it can be really hard to watch. I can't wait to see it. And I, I, I love that you obviously, like I said, this, this project, this podcast started as a thing with my wife and I, yeah. and, and that you guys have this project together as husband and yeah. wife. And, and I believe that I believe that honestly, that's what actually nature wants. Like nature wants Joe and Jill Biden and Kamala Harris. Nature wants equity, everyone represented, the female male, whatever that is. I don't care if you're trans, you're gay. Like, I don't care, mm -hmm. but everyone represented because sure. you know we have lived in a patriarchy. We do. We live in misogyny in our various careers and lives. It shows up everywhere for us. So this film has undercurrents. My husband's a total dude. He's an Italian. He's a total dude, but he's also an artist and he's a progressive person. So he cannot deny certain things. Sure. And so he's allowing that, that openness. He has an openness. He's the hero of the film. He takes one for the team big time. Because for a woman, he, I mean, I have women write me and be like, leave that fucking asshole you know Jeez. and then i have men who are like I, women write me and say my husband and i are in a fight he will not watch the film he watched the first three he's so angry like it it brings up a lot for people because it's a man kind of saying hey here i am i'm not i'm not i'm there's no equity we need equity like it's mm -hmm. so poetic how it's done but it's a bit of a game changer about our roles and like about society mm -hmm. it's, it's deep <clears throat> well i cannot it's wait not to shallow it. and petty all right <laughs> well like exactly i didn't think it would be well <laughs> since since this film was done you know a couple of years ago or at least over a year ago have you guys been working on well like is this project going to continue obviously with like another record or you you live you know you you work you together. sound like the label Oh, so I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm just curious because I love the album. I was listening to it earlier today. And um, so I'm like, whoa, okay, well, this is and like I said, I got kind of confused with the, the geofencing of the of the film. And I'm like, okay, well, it, this is supposed to go together. Okay, well, this is obviously a project. What are they continuing this? Or I did see, I mean, your husband has a record coming out or was working on a record, yeah. I think, for our lady piece. Weird. And you released a record in 2020. Yeah. So you've got a lot going on. Um, I know. Where, where, weird, does, right? where but, does this sit? <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. But I think of people like, you know, um, like Leslie Feist, who is Feist, and she has broken, broken social scene, mm -hmm. too. Like, I think it's a project that we love and that we are very committed to. 
And honestly, I think it's, if I might speak for my husband, like this is for the duration, you know? Sure. Um, but we, we can't plan the future. We can't, we don't know things, but we know that we love it. And we know that we found our sound and our footing. And it's, it's a beautiful thing for our relationship. It kind of reflects, you know, a belief that kind of comes in. If you do a lot of work in marriage, you come to realize that a marriage where the partners don't have something that they do together truly is, is a dead marriage. It's a dead marriage walk-in. And I think moon versus sun is something that while maybe we'll fight our way through it for the rest of our life, it's something that uh, on a sort of big level, we, we very much agree upon it, right? Mm -hmm. And we're both very passionate about it and it's ours. And, um, and that's beautiful. So um, it's on, like Donkey Kong. I love Kong. it. I yeah. love that. I love it. Yeah. I can't wait to see the film and I really appreciate you, you doing this today, Chantel. I have oh, one I'm more so question honored. for you. Yes, um, do you have any advice for aspiring artists? Oh, that's a great one. Yeah. Remember when I said at the beginning, I was like, I don't have advice because it's all forms of luck. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you know, I, I will say this because it's something that I'm continually learning. Okay. It always comes back. Um, if you're not, you can think a lot of shit in your head about what you are or what your vision is, what you think you know, who you think you know. But if you're not doing it and you're not showing it and you're not showing up with the goods and you're not practicing it and it's not physically occurring, you got nothing. You got nothing. You got to go and put in, you know, go get your minutes. Like my kids' coaches, they, they all talk about minutes on the basketball court. It's all about minutes. So you just have to keep on, like, you just got to, you know, I guess it's stupid cliche now, right? It's become a master. And everyone's journey is different. And that's something that's born of you. You're a snowflake. I mean, everyone's different. Some people are great at a particular instrument and that eventually leads them into the writing zone or into, <clears throat> you know, touring or what have you. And then the next thing they know, they're the art. I don't know, like it comes different for everyone, but whatever it is, you have to practice it. And, and when I say practice, I don't mean, I don't mean like you're home alone practicing. I mean, the practice of it, get out there, do it, make mistakes. Who cares? I, I, I always think of this one story, Shh, quiet. I think of this one story where, um, I was, you know, I, I was sort of bumped into Drake one night and we were like, okay, let's go back to the studio. Let's make some music. He was making his first song after his EP for Take Care, you know? And, and, and um, you know, I ended up singing and producing on and writing, uh, co-writing, but, you know, the first song of the album, Take Care, which is um, Over My Dead Body. <clears throat> and I'll tell you, I'd had some really crappy sessions for the several months prior. And I remember when I came home to LA, because that was in Toronto, and we'd, we'd ended up staying in the studio for on and off over the week and getting the song going. And I said to Ray, he said, how was it? And I said, you know, it, it was so great because it made every crappy session I did that year make sense. That's how that song was born of a heaping pile of seamy crap. You know what I'm saying? Like, you just have to go through it. There's no way around it. It's hard work. It's an isolating job. It's isolating work to be an artist. Um, and then also live your life. Don't kill yourself over it. It's not worth it. You're going to get so jerked around. Oh my God, I've got stories. Oh my God. Someone told me the other day, they listened to a podcast where, where the person who screwed me around the most yet in the music business in the past 20 years she got on her podcast and she said, and they said, well, why aren't you really songwriting anymore? And her response was, you know, after a while, it just ripped my heart out too much. It was just too competitive. And that was coming from the person that myself and dozens of other victims have lived, you know, through her brand of, 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 uh, of torture. So, that's what I'm talking about. This business is tough. So if she thinks she got screwed around and it was too competitive for her, <laughs> that's amazing. So you gotta be tough and 
you have to find your love and your joy and your laughter. I love to go to watch comedians uh, do stand up and and you got to keep the light on, man, because it's tough. Um, don't take it too seriously, but you have to work hard. Bring it back.